I now look to Thomas Riley to close the case for the proposition. Mr. President, uh, thank you for the uh, honor uh, of appearing uh, in this chamber uh, tonight. Uh, I must admit, I wish the subject were somewhat different um, than that of the Catholic Church. You see, I'm a Catholic. I was born and raised in a very devout Catholic family, son of Irish immigrants. Our faith was very important to us. My faith is important to me now. It sustained us, my Catholic faith it sustained us through some unbearable tragedies that happened early in my life. I would not have gone to college without the help of our local parish priest. I would have not have been able to continue my law studies when I couldn't afford it without the assistance of a Jesuit priest. But somewhere along the way, they taught me an awful lot. They gave me a very clear sense of right and wrong and a commitment to the truth. And the truth is, there is a dark side to this church. I first saw it about 35 years ago when a Catholic priest was arrested and charged with the rape of an altar boy. Think about it, rape of an altar boy, a very serious offense. And we were going to treat him like anyone else. He's going to prison. And then I got a call and a meeting from the representative of the Archbishop of Boston, the Vicar General, his name was Father Banks. By the way, the fellow, the priest was Eugene O'Sullivan. I'll come back to him. And he came to me and he said, we understand you're insisting that he go to prison. I said, yes, we are. And he said, listen, we're asking you, and the archbishop is asking you, almost demanding really, that you change your mind, that you release him to us. We will put him in a treatment facility and he'll never be near children again. Well, basically I said to him, you can do what you want with him when he gets out of prison. But then I saw the power and the influence of the Catholic Church very swiftly, very skillfully, they maneuvered the case to a very devout Catholic judge. It was a fight, but the judge rejected our argument that he go to prison and instead released him to the custody, the care and the custody of the Catholic Church, and off he went. Now, 17 years ago, I was now the Attorney General of Massachusetts. I was determined I'm going to take a closer look at what's going on in that archdiocese. And we undertook a very comprehensive investigation. And of course, they promised that they would cooperate. They didn't. More delay, more delay. Finally, we had had enough of it. And we sent state police to the chancery. That's the center of power and influence of the Catholic Church in the city of Boston. And we sent them there with subpoenas for the cardinal, cardinal law, and for their records. Well, the poor seminarian, a young seminarian that opened the door almost fainted, dead away to see state police at the chancery looking for the cardinal. And he said, well, he's not here, he's unavailable. I don't know where he was that day, but I know within 24 hours he left for Rome. So anything, any suggestion or notion, they didn't know about it, they've known about this every step of the way. Now, Mitchell's described what our investigation went on. We got a hold of the secret files, and it, it, it's terrible. He, what he described to you is absolutely accurate. As they maneuvered people, switched people around, hid the truth, covered up, they did all of that uh, and more. But we wanted to find out a bit more, and I'll share this with you in terms of Father Eugene O'Sullivan. What did they do? They did what they said they would do at the beginning. They sent him to a treatment facility in Ontario, Canada. But then six months later, they released him. Did he come back to Boston? No. Everyone knew in Boston. Where did he go? They sent him to New Jersey, to another bishop, McCarrick. He's the cardinal that was defrocked just a week or so again. And what happened to Father Banks? the vicar general who testified on his behalf. Well, we found out that Father Banks knew about a lot of other examples, incidents of abuse by Eugene O'Sullivan. Did he tell us? No. He kept it secret. Did he tell the judge? No. And what happened to him? 
he became, he got promoted to a bishop. And all of those that had handled and kept it secret and kept it quiet, they all became bishops. That what was going on. What about Eugene O'Sullivan? What happened to him? He did it again. He did it again. And that young man died a very tragic and a very young life. It's absolutely horrible what happened. But where are we now? This last day of February in 2019, where are we? Marcy's right. There's been some progress back home. They have better monitoring, screening, uh, some training, but it's all marginal. It's all marginal. Her work has been more impressive. Statute of limitations, uh, reporting requirements, all of that work is good. But how about the institution? This is a powerful institution, one of the most powerful in the world, with its headquarters in Rome, with its CEO, the current pope. What about them? Have they changed? Absolutely not. The business plan that they practice on, on, on us when we looked at them is still the same. Plan A, this is a, this is a church that thinks in terms, not like us, they think in terms of centuries. They've dealt with corruption before and they've gotten through it stronger. That's how they're looking at this. And what's their plan? The plan is the same. Plan A, deny it. Okay, deny it, then delay it. But of course, pay the victims to keep quiet. Keep it all quiet. And what happens when you're caught? When you're exposed, go to plan B. Okay, plan B, plan B is, is a, little bit, a little bit different because now you've got to face up to it. We're so sorry. We are going to change. We promise we are going to change. And we'll make structural, some real serious changes. Have they done that? Absolutely not. On the institutional level, as I said, they think in terms of centuries. And the truth is, and the fact is, of what has happened, you can never pay for what has happened. Mitchell will tell you it's the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg in terms of, we're a small state in a very big nation, okay? We had 750 instances of abuse, 250 priests. But we're one small state in a very big nation. In a nation, a big nation, part of a much larger world. And you will find this any place you look in the world where the Catholic Church has a presence. I suggest to you that there's no way that the Catholic Church can ever pay for its sins. It's certainly the magnitude of it. Another factor is, it's no coincidence that where we know about this, there's a free press. And there's civil authorities who are willing to press for the truth. In large parts of the world, that is not the case. Are the Catholic Church going to volunteer this? No. You will never, ever see the light of day. You, would never, you cannot never pay for something when you don't even know what the price is and what it's actually have. There's another reason. It's the culture. It's the culture of the Catholic Church, and I'll tick through it very quickly, okay? First of all is the culture instilled in the seminary. That somehow, okay, it's beyond secrecy and it's beyond obedience. That somehow once you're ordained, you're given a special pass. Or you're somehow better, somehow privileged, somehow have authority. That's what Father Banks was coming to me for. As a Catholic, I would obey. But we're no longer, we are no longer their sheep or their flock. And they are not our shepherd. The second thing I want to point out too is, to me it's a sin. The way the Catholic Church teach, uh, treats women is shameful, absolutely shameful. Elizabeth talked a little bit about it in terms of the nuns. But yeah, you can serve, but you will never be in a position of authority. That's how they look at it, okay? The next thing that has to change as we move along is this church needs oversight. And that oversight cannot come from civil authorities, nor should it. It has to come from the laity but they have to be authorized and have power. Oversight at every level, I'm not talking about the parish, I'm talking about bishops all the way up to the Vatican. Now, will this happen? Of course it won't happen now. With this group, it's a terrible situation when your members are better Catholics than your leadership. But that is the truth of what's happened. They will not change. But that change is coming. Because this is about power for them, but that change is coming. And that change will be driven by Catholics who are going to be true to their faith. 
and we'll force that change over time. It will take a long time. I'm optimistic about that. Will it happen in my lifetime? Never. It'll happen in your lifetime. As they force it, as they fight for the truth, and they fight to take their, their religion uh, and their church back. In the meantime, it is our duty to speak the truth as best we can. And I close by saying this. I argue that the truth is that this is a corrupt institution. The, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church is corrupt and have been corrupt in a long, for a long period of time, and they will not change. The truth is that for a long period of time, all over this world, there's been an institutional acceptance of the abuse and sexual abuse of, of children by priests. That is the truth. Close by saying and, and asking you, when you walk out that door tonight, I ask you to send a powerful message to the Catholic Church. We don't care how powerful you are. We don't care how rich you are. You can never pay for what you have done to innocent children and women. Thank you. God bless you.